Welcome back. Again, it's uh, Mr. Chaim Zappo from Ort Yad Leibovitch High School in Netanya coming to you with another lesson, continuing our saga on learning the wave, wave part two. Today we're going to finish our review and summary of chapters 9 through 17. We're going to finish the book. Uh, and again, I want to remind people, this is not in place of reading. You should read the book, and then if you want to review, this is a quick way to review, but you definitely should read the book. Uh, and uh, this is only for review purposes because I'm skipping a lot of material. The book is over 140 pages. There's no way I'm reading you. You're getting everything by listening to review, but maybe you're, I'm only touching on the highlights of the, of the story. So let's get started. And uh, what are our goals for this lesson? Kind of similar to the previous goals, uh, the previous lesson. Yeah, you can recall what happened in chapters one through eight. So we're in a little review of what we did in, last, in our last session. Uh, second, remember what's going on, the sequence of events in the rest of the story, in the rest of the novel, and identify the climax in the solution to the problem of the story, which is called the resolution. And the climax, remember, is the turning point of the story, where all the actions build up to the most the greatest action, and then from there, actions kind of slow down towards the end. So uh, we're going to see that in our, in, our, in our presentation today. So let's do a little quick review of what we did in the last session of chapters one through eight. What happened? And here we have this kind of plot diagram, as you can see. And at the top is the climax. Uh, the climax did not happen in chapters one through eight. It will happen now, but we can see that there are e actions and events that are happening that are leading up to the climax. So let's see what happened first. So the first thing that happened is the origins of the wave. And what is the origins? That, how it got started. And how did it get started? Mr. Ross can't answer the students' questions about how the Germans denied knowing about the Shoah after World War II. How can they deny it? You know, we saw people today trying to deny it. Iran is trying to de deny the Shoah. Okay, how can they say such things? These are the people that actually did it. How can they say they didn't know? Um, so that's one. He, could, he didn't have an answer to the students how they could say such things. It doesn't make sense. Number two, the answer is not in a book. Ben Ross realizes that in order to answer the question, the students would have to experience what it could have been like in Nazi Germany. So he's got to give them a taste of what it meant, what it was like to be a citizen under the Nazis' rule. Okay? And then maybe they could understand why they said they didn't know anything. Next. Strength through discipline. Ben creates the lesson to give the students a feeling of power through self-discipline, through self-control. He drills them, that means he practices with the students, the way to sit and to answer questions with discipline. Okay? So he practices with them, and this gives them a sense of power, like they have control over their environment, control over each other, and so on. Strength through community. Next, Mr. Ross explains how community is power. He creates a symbol for their new community, a wave and a salute for all members of the wave that they must do when they see each other. So now he's creating a community uh, where they have a symbol and a sign that they give to each other. And remember, the Nazis also had that. They had a symbol and a sign uh, and, a, and a salute that they would say. Next, the yellow cards. Then in the next lesson, Ben teaches the final motto, the final saying for the wave, strength through action. Then he passes out membership cards for the wave to all of its students. Some of the students are chosen to be monitors and report to him if anyone doesn't keep the rules. So now he's got discipline, he's got community, and he's got now action with people like a secret police, secret monitors, checking up on the other members of the way. Okay, let's continue. And he did it all in three days. That's how fast this is moving. 
So let's see how it, what it looks like now. By the fourth day, Ben began to notice that the students from other classes were attending his history class. So he's getting students from, that are not his students are coming to his class. His class is becoming filled. There's going to be no room in the class. Despite the larger class size, so now instead of having 30 kids, let's say he has 50 students. All of us teachers always say, you know, we, we had less students. We could teach much more and it would be more organized and people would be more listening. Here, it didn't matter how many students he had. Even the bigger the class, if you had discipline the way he's doing, doesn't matter how, this, how big the class is, and see, we'll see why. Despite the larger class size, the pupils managed to cover the material even faster than before. So they're going faster than they did before, even though the class might be 20 more students. Ben noticed that the students came to class more prepared. And with his quick answer question method, the students were able to, ans to finish the material quickly to have more time in class to spend on the way. Although the students were more prepared and could answer short fact questions by heart, he did notice that their ability to analyze, their ability to think on their own and explain had decreased. So they could answer uh, the question, what's the capital of Israel? Jerusalem. Okay, well, of course you have to say it quickly. Mr. Ross, Jerusalem. Right? That would be the correct way to answer and, uh, but if you asked them, why is it Jerusalem, they wouldn't be able to do it. So they could answer facts, but when it came to thinking, they were, they, they, their ability went down. The wave was even adopted by the football team to build team spirit. So the wave is changing the students. So let's give you a little example of what this quick method uh, looks like, and this is a, from a, a British show called The Weakest Link, and you're going to see in just one minute and 30 seconds how fast, how much material the teacher, the, the, the one who's running the game show, can ask the students and get back. And you're going to see it's amazing how fast they can move. They, they cover 10 questions in one minute, um, and, and they have time to answer. So. Uh, this is kind of what Mr. Ross is doing in his class. So let's take a look. Let's play The Weakest Link. First question is for £20. Start the clock. Alan, in medicine, a dentist is a professional practitioner who treats and advises patients on the care of which parts of the body? Teeth. Correct. Jane, in cooking, which word follows icing, castor and granulated to give the names of three forms of common food stuff? Sugar. Correct. Richard, in nature, what A is the name given to the fruit of an oak tree? Acorn. Correct. Rachel, according to the words of the musical song, I do like to be beside the what? Seaside. Correct. Michael, in language, when someone is trying to achieve an impossible goal, they are said to be chasing what? Rainbows or rain clouds? Rainbows. Correct. Claire, in the fairy tale, Goldilocks ate which food in the house of the three bears? Porridge. Correct. Andy, in maths, what is 21 minus 18? Three. Correct. Billy. In everyday behavior, after sneezing, a person will frequently blow which part of their anatomy? Their nose. Correct. Harriet. In motor insurance, what is the term for a person not named in a contract but covered for damages incurred by the insured? Third party or backseat driver? Third party. Correct. Alan. Fun. Okay, you've reached and backed your £1,000 target. And that money will go through to the next round. One of you won't, of course. Who is it? Who's worrying you? But that was just a taste of kind of rapid question, like really fast questions and really quick answers. Um, and that's the format of the game. So he kind of brought that to the classroom. Now notice, it's just quick fact questions. There's no, uh, there's, n there's never going to be a why. It's always going to be when, what, who. There'll never be why in these kind of answers. And the why is really the analysis. So his students are really good at memorizing facts but uh, wouldn't be very good at answering an essay question. Let's continue on. So Ben had even thought about how this new method, this new way of teaching, could be adopted by other teachers to make their lessons more disciplined. Ben had 
to catch himself and remind himself what his original goal of the experiment was. Finally, Lori had another conversation with her mother, who was worried after talking to Robert's mother. She described how Robert was like a new person at school and at home. Miss Saunders was worried because Robert was acting like a person who was a member of a cult. Here's a picture of kind of the kids with the lights on in their eyes. And number one, so let's deal with the question number one. What evidence do we have that Ben Ross might be losing himself in his role as the wave? So right here. Ben is thinking, wow, this is really working. These kids are learning quickly and they're listening and they're they're practicing and they're doing their homework. Um, this is a kind of new way of teaching. I could I, I could teach other teachers to do it, and this could catch on, and this the whole idea of discipline in the classroom and, and this process would be great. And then he has to remind himself this was not the point of the experiment. The point of the experiment was to give the students a taste of Nazi Germany, not to come up with some new way of teaching um, using uh, kind of Nazi ideas as, a, as the backbone. Um, number two, how do you think people change when they join a cult? So that's your own opinion, right? But a, uh, let's find out first what a cult is. And maybe they'll give us an idea of how to answer that. So this first person you see here, this little one-minute show about cults, and the first person you see on the screen he had, had a cult. His name is Charles Manson. He, he, murdered, he had his cult members murder people. Um, in the 1960s. Again, this is a time period where lots of things going on. And, and uh, his, name of the cult, his name of the cult that he had was called The Family. Um, and, uh, but this will, we're going to watch this now, and then we're going to try to figure out how people change when they're members of a cult. So let's find out what a cult is, first of all. Cults, of course, is a very broad term. For a lot of scholars of religion, we tend to not use the word cult because, you know, as we joke, cult plus time equals religion. Usually when people think about cults, what they think about is some kind of closed community that is usually dominated by some megalomaniac who controls <laughs> everyone's minds. Here are three important things to understand about a cult. Number one, just because it's a cult doesn't mean it's evil or insidious. Many cults bring people together for good. Number two, there really isn't that much of a difference between a religion and a cult. A lot of the greatest religions, most successful religions in the world began as cults. And number three, cults are as cults do. If it works towards good in the world, then it's fine. If it works towards evil in the world, then it's a problem. Great. So as you can see, cults are very similar. And as a professional here on uh, CNN said, cults are very similar to religion. Um, but there are some things you telltale signs of a cult, someone who is um, giving all their property and all their money to the cult or cutting their ties to re relationships with parents and friends who are not in the cult. Um, those are kind of signs that the cult is very unhealthy. But not every cult's a bad thing. And sometimes their cults are there do some positive work. But uh, a sign of, of being involved in an unhealthy group is when that group takes you away from your normal life and completely changes your personality. And that's what Mrs. Sanders is really uh, worried about. That Robert is a completely different person now. Before he was a loser, he kept to himself. He was quiet, uh, uninvolved, and now he's you know, talking and participating. He's dressing nice. He's combing his hair. He, uh, he's, a, he's not like, like normal Robert. Um, so let's continue on. Let's get to chapter 10. So chapter 10, let's see what's going on. When, missed, when Ben was sitting in the teacher's room, when someone came and told him the principal wanted to see him in his office now, 
Ben felt nervous. He knew the meeting was probably about the way. On, on, his, on his way to the meeting, he thought to himself that Owens had heard some complaints about the wave and would tell him the, to end the experiment. That's what he thought. So let's see what happens with Mr. Owens. It's a picture of him, maybe. Uh, let's continue. However, when he entered the principal's room, the principal was in a good mood. He had only heard the praise of the wave by the football coach. Remember, the football coach had joined the, the football team had joined the wave and to get team spirit and is working. The, the team is working together harder now, and the football coach is happy. So he went to the principal and he told him, "Ah, oh, this wave is great for the football team." So that's what he's heard so far. So the principal is, is happy to see Ben. He's only heard good things about the wave, and now he wants to know more about it. After Ben explained the experiment and what its goals was, Owen looked less happy. So Principal Owens did not look as happy as before. He warned Ben to be careful. Teenagers tend to take things too far and lacked judgment. Mr. Ross assured the principal, that means he, he, made, he, he tried to make him feel like he was in control, and he told the principal that the experiment was under complete control and he make, make, who make sure that nothing would happen like that. So he told them that I have complete control over the experiment and it's not going to get go too far and get out of hand. So number three, what is Owens worried about? So as we can see, he's worried about teenagers. Uh, there's a reason in Hebrew why it's called tepechisre, right? Stupid tins. Teens really have a tough time knowing when to stop, when there is a, when the gavul is, where is the gavul. And uh, sometimes they take things too far and do things that are without thinking or do dangerous things. Um, just look at how many teens get in car wrecks and you'll, and you'll know. Um, so Mr. Owens warns him of this, warns him that sometimes you give a st student something to do and they get too obsessed about it. Um, Number four, do you think he's right to be worried? So again, you're a teen, so you know hear what's going on in the story. Maybe you think he's right. Maybe you think Mr. Ross has got it all under control. What's your opinion of that? It's for you to decide, but uh, it's, again, a foreshadow, a clue about the future. So if he's thinking and talking about it now, probably chances are it will happen. It will get out of control. So let's see if that's true. Chapter 11, the warning letter. Lori entered the publication office of the Grapevine, that's the school newspaper, thinking about what she could write in her article about the wave when she saw an envelope on the floor of the room by the door. In it was the letter from the, an 11th grade student explaining how a senior, a 12th grader, you'd bet, pressured he or she and her friends to join the wave. After he had convinced them to come to one of the wave classes in Mr. Ross's room, most of the friends said they would join, but the writer of the letter refused. The 12th grader then said, I better join before it would be too late. So number five, what's our question? What do you think he means when he warns you better join before it's too late? Too late for what? So you could take this as, well, maybe you'll be, you know, you won't have any friends anymore, or maybe you'll be left behind, or maybe something's going to happen to you. Maybe it's a real threat. Lori was disturbed by the letter. She wasn't very disturbed by the threat of the 12th grader. Lori was concerned by something else. Because the writer of the letter didn't give his name, but wrote it anonymously, this bothered her because it gave her a sense of fear that people had if they weren't against the wave. Why didn't he write his name on the letter? Finally, in this chapter, Robert asks Mr. Ross if he can be his bodyguard. Ben is reluctant at first, but Robert begs him and tells him how the wave has helped him. No one picks on me anymore. What bothers Lori most about the letter? As you can see, that the person who wrote it didn't put their name on it. Why do you think Ben didn't want Robert to be a bodyguard at first? What does he need a bodyguard for? He's a teacher. He's the leader of the way. How about, however, number eight, 
How would it benefit Robert and Ben's experiment if he would be a, his bodyguard? First of all, it would make Robert second in control, charge, right? He's number two to Ben Ross in the way. He's his bodyguard, right? He has power as well. And how would it benefit Ben? Ben now's power is elevated because the more people you have working for you, the more powerful you are. So the more bodyguards and the more secretaries and the more people that people have to go to in order to meet you gives you more power. Right? That's why you know you know if the prince you know the principal runs the school because the principal has a mascara that you have to talk to in order to see the principal. That gives the principal more power, although she does things for him. You, don't, you can't just walk into the principal's office and talk to them. You have to have a meeting, and you have to talk to the secretary to get that meeting. And so do the teachers. So uh, we're going to continue on, but let's take a break now, and we'll continue on with chapter, uh, uh, chapter 12 afterward. And I'll uh, see you in 10. Take care. Bye.
Welcome back again. Uh, last time we took off uh, looking at the wave and looking at uh, Ben uh, Robert asking Ben Ross to be his bodyguard and Ben agreeing, which would help uh, Ben increase his level of uh, power and authority. And also Robert would also increase as well with that. Uh, the thing that bothered Lori the most about the letter was that the person who wrote the letter was too scared to put their name on it, which made her say, think that maybe there's something to be scared of with this wave. Um, let's continue to chapter 12. And what's our name for chapter 12? The Breakup. Lori, from the window of the Grapevine office, the Grapevine, remember, is the newspaper, sees two boys fighting outside in the yard. As a teacher ran out to break up the fight, she was shocked to hear that one of the boys was yelling to the crowd of students the mottos of the wave as he was being taken to the principal's office. At that moment, David came in the room and asked Lori if she was going to the wave rally that afternoon. Rallies like to get together to, to cheer from the students. Um, Lori said no, and David had an, had an argument with her about how she needed to support the wave. David told Lori that she was against the wave because now everyone was equal and she wasn't the best anymore. So David's like, you're not, you don't like the wave anymore because remember you used to be the best in the class, the little princess who knew all the answers and got all the A's? And now everyone's equal. So this is, you feel like you're not special anymore. Lori told him that he was being stupid. So David got angry and told her to go find a smart boyfriend. And they broke up. So number nine, why do you think Lori was shocked by the fight she saw? So if you remember, what shocked her was to hear that one of the boys in the fight was yelling the wave motto. So maybe she thought, well, maybe they were fighting over the wave. Or why would someone who's fighting tell the other students, strength through discipline, strength through community, doesn't seem to make sense unless the wave had something to do with it. Maybe he was fighting the child, the other student, because he wouldn't join the wave. Uh, number 10, why did David break up with Lori? They broke up over the wave, over Lori not wanting to be part of it anymore, not wanting to go and be with the other wave members and cheer on the wave and celebrate the wave. Um, and, and that's why they broke up. How can David be have a girlfriend who's against what he is such what he loves, what he's a member of. Doesn't work. So he broke up with her. Let's go on. Later that night, Lori's father came to her room and told her that he had heard from a friend that a new student at the school had been beaten up by the wave members. The student was Jewish and he wanted to know if Lori had heard anything. Lori immediately couldn't believe it. She told her father, the wave was nothing like that. Lori said, it was supposed to give us a taste of Nazi Germany, not to make us into little Nazis. Again, foreshadow. So this shocked her that maybe a, a student at the school was beaten up because he was Jewish. Although Mr. Ross didn't say anything about the wave and connecting it to Jews and so on, uh, maybe it's... Maybe it was the cause of why he got beaten up, this, this new Jewish student. Let's continue. Chapter 13. And what are we going to call that? No salute for me. Let's come up with a plan. Lori, for the past three years, had always sat next to her best friend, Amy, at every football game. After breaking up with David, she really needed to talk to her. So when she arrived at the football field to sit down, she was surprised to see Brian making everyone who wanted to enter to give the wave salute. So in order for you to go sit down in the seats and watch a football game, call them the bleachers, right? You had to get up there first of all, and who was waiting at the, at the, at the, at, at the, at the, in the spiel, in the path, in the aisle to get up there was Brian. And in order to get up, you had to give the salute, the wave salute, and to say the mottos. Lori refused and argued with Brian. He told her people are watching her and she should give the salute. Lori left the game. So Lori didn't get to see Amy. She didn't get to go to the game. She refused and she left. 
That afternoon, Lori had the newspaper staff meet at her house to plan the special grapevine edition they were going to write, Attacking the Wave. So Lori has decided now the wave has gone way too far. It's changing the school. It's keeping people who don't want to be away from other members of the wave and even away from the football games. She's going to write a newspaper against the wave. So number 11, why did Lori want to go to the game? It wasn't to watch the football game. It was to talk to her best friend, Amy. Remember, she probably wanted to talk about how her and David broke up, and maybe she can help them get back together. Number 12, what new requirements is the WAVE making students do? So look, now the WAVE is making, in order to participate in after-school activities, the WAVE is making them give the salute in order to enter those activities. Let's continue. So let's do a little recap of chapters 9 through 13 so uh, we didn't get lost. Number one, students in Mr. Ross' class have changed into well-disciplined, equal members of a community who salute each other and who are spreading the wave throughout the school. Number two, Robert has become a proud member of the wave and is like a different person. Three, Miss Saunders is concerned that the wave seems to her like a cult. F four, Lori reads a disturbing letter about how the wave is pressuring pupils, students to join. Five, David breaks up with Lori because of the wave. Six, Mr. Saunders tells Lori about a Jewish student who was beaten up by wave members. And finally, Lori and the grapevine staff decide they have to write a newspaper special addition to expose the bad side of the wave. Let's continue. Chapter 14, what are we going to call it? Reaction to the newspaper. So we have this, the newspapers come out. Let's see what the reaction is by the school. Lori had to show her best friend Amy what she had wrote about the wave before she put it out, before she published it. She thought after having read the stories and the truth about the wave, Amy would join her against the movement. She was shocked to find out that Amy was asking her not to print the stories. Amy then told Lori that the wave had given her the freedom not to feel like she was always in competition with Lori over grades and boyfriends. As Amy walked away, Lori felt alone. So now her best friend has left her. That the wave has, why does Amy want to be a member of the wave? Because now she doesn't feel the pressure to compete against Lori for grades and boyfriends. They had a kind of weird relationship where Amy was always trying to copy what Lori was doing. And now she doesn't feel like she has to. 13, how is Amy's response to Lori similar to David's? It's similar in the fact that now uh, they, they're blaming Lori for why Lori's attitude for why she doesn't like the wave. Now, Lori, you're not the you're not you're not the best anymore. Everyone's equal, so we don't have to we don't have to be with you now. If you don't want to be equal to everybody else, if you want to be special and different, then you can be that on your own. You're not a member of the wave. Let's continue. Later that afternoon, as the students and the teachers read the paper, more and more people began to tell stories against the wave. Robert and a few members met up. Robert said that the newspaper was trying to ruin the wave and that David, remember David's Lori's ex-boyfriend, should tell Lori to stop lying about the wave. David agreed and Brian and David would wait after school to convince her to stop. 14. Why do you think David volunteered to try to convince Lori to stop against the, against, writing against the wave? Well, he probably volunteered because he probably still thinks that he can talk to Lori, since that's Lori's boyfriend. Maybe he's the one that, of all people, could convince her to try to join the wave or at least stop going against the wave. Chapter 15. We are not playing around anymore. The grapevine staff stayed late to celebrate the big success of the newspaper. Everyone in the school wanted to read their newspaper. Lori stayed to clean up the mess from the party. As she left the school, she went to her locker to put her books away and saw that someone wrote enemy on her locker. She then quickly walked home. 
On her way home, David met her and tried to argue with her to stop printing bad things about the way. She yelled at him that she will write anything she wants and that they can't stop her. David, all right, note here I have a circle. This is the climax. Here's where all the actions of the story come to the, the most powerful action, okay? The turning point where things start to change for the wave, probably in the bad way. David got angry and pushed Lori to the ground. She began to cry, and David realized how crazy the wave had made him feel. They both decided to go to Mr. Ross to tell him that he has to stop the wave. After the newspaper came out, Ben went home early. So remember, Mr. Ross is Ben. His wife came back home from school and asked him to end the way before someone gets hurt. Ben said he knows he has to do something, but he can't just end it without having taught the wave members some lesson. It wouldn't be right to leave the students confused. His wife told him he needs to think of something. Mr. Owens wants to see him in the morning. Then Laurie and David rang the bell and told Mr. Ross everything. Ben told them he would stop the wave and that they had to trust him because he had a plan. 15, would you trust Mr. Ross to stop the wave? That's your own opinion. Remember, Mr. Ross is the leader of the wave. Maybe he really likes the wave. Maybe he's lost himself. Maybe he does want to stop the wave. Would you trust that if you were Laurie and David? 16. The wave is going national. The next morning, Ben and met with Principal Owens. Owens was very serious and angry at Ben for allowing the wave to cause so much chaos and complaints from parents and teachers. Ben promised he would end the wave, but he needed to do this his own way so that students could learn something from the experience. So I have a plan, Mr. Ross. I'm going to end the wave you got to let me do it my way. We can't just have wasted the week and caused all these problems and not have taught the students anything. Mr. Owens agreed. He told Ben he had to end the wave that day. And he warned him if he doesn't do this right, he could lose his job. 16, why is Owens angry at Ben? He's angry at Ben because obviously the wave has gotten out of control. Teachers are complaining, students are complaining, the parents are complaining. This one teacher is turning the school in this, through this experiment upside down. So when you do that to school, usually you lose your job. Uh, but he wants to give Ben a chance to end this because uh, maybe the students will learn something from it. Later in that history class, to the horror to the, to the, uh, of Laurie and David, Mr. Ross announced to the, there would be a wave rally. So instead of ending the wave in class, he said, we're going to have another wave rally so that all the members could receive a message from the leader of the national movement. So he told all the students that, that, that the wave, wave movement is going on in other schools too. And they're a member of a bigger national movement, and their leader of the whole national movement is going to talk to them today. Lori and David tried to interrupt Mr. Ross, so Ben took Lori and David to the principal's office. He returned to class and told all the students that all WAVE members need to come to the auditorium, that's the, the room where you, everyone meets, at 5 p.m. for a meeting. Lori and David decided to try to sneak into the meeting. 17, imagine how Lori and David must have felt. They must have felt so stupid to trust Mr. Ross, right? Now, he told him he would end the wave, and now he's telling them that the wave is uh, even bigger than the school and that he's going to have the students meet the national leader. They must have felt betrayed. Let's continue. Chapter 17, our last chapter. A lesson learned. Only WAVE members were allowed into the packed auditorium to see their national leader. The students brought posters of the WAVE. Robert was on stage as Mr. Ross's bodyguard, and two large TVs were set up on the stage. Mr. Ross said, get ready to see your leader. 
He turned on the TVs and there was nothing but blue screen. After a few minutes, the students started to talk and one yelled out, there is no leader. Number 18, how do you think the students felt when they came to the meeting? So in the beginning, they probably felt very excited. They have the posters, Mr. Ross was on the stage, but after a few minutes of not hearing from the leader, maybe they started to get a little angry or anxious. Maybe their trust in Mr. Ross was going away. Let's see what happened. Suddenly, the projector came on with a picture of Hitler from the film that Ben had showed them the class about the Holocaust. Mr. Ross said, this is your leader. You traded your freedom for equality, but you turned your equality to superiority, thinking that you're better than other people, better than the non-wave members. Yes, you would have all made good Nazis. You accepted the group's will over your own beliefs, over your own convictions, no matter who you had to hurt to do it. So this is the resolution. This is the answer to the question, how did the German people deny that they knew about the Shoah and what the Nazis had done? How did they sit back and let 10% of the population do all this damage and chaos and say nothing? Now we know. The resolution to the problem, the story. The German people's reaction to the Nazis is something that could happen to anybody. It wasn't special to Germany. Here, look at these kids in America. They're doing the same things. In one week, they're acting like Nazis. It only took five lessons they did it in. That's how fast something like this can happen, where people stop thinking for themselves and follow a leader blindly. So why would the students have made good Nazis? Because they gave up their own beliefs for the will of the community, the will of the movement, the will of the leader. And let's just to give you a sense of what they got to see in the video. I'll play a little speech from 1935 of Hitler giving a speech to the Reichstag, the German parliament, the German Knesset. Du, meine Arbeit für richtig hältst, ob du glaubst, dass ich fleißig gewesen bin, dass ich gearbeitet habe, dass ich mich in diesen Jahren für dich eingesetzt habe dass ich anständig meine Zeit verwendet habe im Dienste meines Volkes. Gib du jetzt deine Stimme ab. Wenn ja, dann tritt für mich ein, so wie ich für dich eingetreten bin. Okay, let's continue. So, as you can saw, we saw a little video of Hitler showing, trying to show his power. He's doing power moves with his fists and pounding. Um, and that's what they saw probably in the film as well, um, a picture of Hitler giving one of his speeches. Right? Um, let's continue. Ben continued speaking to the shock students. I hope from this experiment that you've learned that we are all responsible for our actions and that you must always question what you do than to blindly follow a leader and that for the rest of your lives, you will never allow a group's will, what a group believes, to usurp. That means to take away your individual rights. Okay? And as I pointed here, this is the lesson that Ross wants to teach his students. So if you were to try to boil the message of the wave, the message of the book is right there in front of you. Never, ever give up your rights or your beliefs to the will of someone else. Question your leaders and their actions, right? Don't follow someone blindly, okay? That's the message of the story, and it comes at the end. So the, the book ends with this resolution. Ben also apologizes for letting the wave go as far as he did. He admitted that he himself also got caught up in the movement 
After he spoke, the student shuffled out of the auditorium, stunned. When Amy saw Lori, she began to cry, and they hugged. Mr. Ross saw Robert offstage crying and put his arm around him. He said, what do you say we ought to go, we go out for a bite to eat? Let's get some food. There are some things we should talk about. And that's how the story ends. That's the last line. Our question is, what do you think Ben will talk to Robert about? Now remember, Robert's got the most to lose. He's second in command. He was a loser just a week ago. Now he's got powers similar to Ben. He's a monitor. He's second in command. What's going to happen now? Right? Is he going to go back to being a loser? Maybe Mr. Ross is going to tell him what he could do, what he should do, or that he's sorry, because really the most damage is done to Robert. Uh, and, and he's the one that should be crying because he has to go back to, does he have to go back to what he was? And that would be the conversation. So you have to think about what, what, how would, if you were Mr. Ross, what would you say to Robert? I know I'm not sure what I would say. I would, first of all, say I was sorry. Let's continue. So did we reach our goals for this lesson? Number one, can you recall the events of the story, chapters 1 through 17? Can you remember what happened before what? What was first? What was last? Well, first we start off with our movie and our question. We ended with the answer to that question that Amy, that Lori asked. Can you identify the climax? Remember the turning point. It's when David actually joins Amy again. What did David do? He pushed her to the ground and he realized that the wave had changed him and that he was doing something wrong. And that begins the end of the wave there. And of course, we saw the resolution. Don't follow a leader blindly. Don't give up your own individuality for the, will, for the good of the group. Thank you for joining us today. Our next lesson will be about characters of the wave and how they change. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.